very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's uh, good to be here virtually. Uh, I, uh, as the introduction commented, I served 11 years as a naval officer in the Royal Canadian Navy. And when in the service, they're teaching you to speak to ship's companies, they uh, teach you to tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. Well, I'm not going to do the talk three times today. I'm just going to do it once. Uh, but as way of, uh, of preamble, uh, I'm going to tell you a story today uh, about a shipping loss uh, our Navy suffered during World War II. And Gordon, uh, could you throw the first slide up, please? The slide is up. Yep, there she goes. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, I served an officer 11 years in the Royal Canadian Navy. Uh, advance, please. And today I'm going to be telling you the story of HMCS Shawinigan, one of Canada's uh, many uh, Corvette class warships that served in the Battle of the Atlantic. Shawinigan was built in Luzon, Quebec. Uh, and actually I should add that a lot of Corvettes were built in Collingwood during the war in Midland as well. But this one was built in Quebec. She had a relatively short career and was tragically lost with all hands due to enemy action off the coast of Newfoundland. Advance please. Uh, this is a photograph of Shawinigan uh, when she was very new, and I started with a drawing of her first because it's so easy when one is telling stories or reading about uh, uh, history to see things two-dimensionally. But the fact is that a ship is a community and it's full of people, and it, uh, it, uh, a loss of a ship is a, a fairly dramatically bad thing. This picture is interesting because uh, of another number of details you can see. One is that the uh, dip in her shear line, that's the top edge of her hull, is relatively forward of the bridge, as is her mast. That's the way early Corvettes were. Later in the war, they extended the forecastle, that's the raised part forward, aft, to increase the accommodation space, and they moved the mast to behind the bridge so uh, to eliminate the condensation that constantly dripped on the officers from it when the ship was at sea. Note also the unusual looking gun that's on her bow. Uh, that is a wooden gun uh, that was given to her for the, uh, her first trips at sea to uh, basically be a dummy, hopefully like a scarecrow uh, until she could be fitted with a real uh, four inch weapon. That's an indication of how desperately Canada needed warships then. We were cranking them out as fast as we could and often they weren't, we weren't able to arm them before they went into, into battle. Note also the flag that's flying towards her stern. That is not a naval ensign, that's the Canadian Red Duster. And that tells me that this photograph was taken before she was accepted uh, into the Royal Canadian Navy. Uh, she was still in the builder's hands. She still belonged to the company that built her. And uh, from the look of her bow wave and her wake along her hull, I'd say she's cranking along at uh, pretty much top speed, probably at her acceptance trials at the conclusion of which she would have been taken into the service. Next, please. Now, I'm going to get on to the, to the story of, uh, of her loss. Uh, in 1942, uh, uh, the only connection, uh, direct connection, that, they, that Newfoundland had with the rest of Canada, and of course, Newfoundland wasn't part of Canada yet then, was the ferry that ran from Sydney, Nova Scotia to Port of Basque, Newfoundland. That was about an eight or 10 hour trip and it was served by the SS Caribou, and this is a photograph of her here. The uh, Germans that year had begun sending submarines into the Gulf of St. Lawrence and up the St. Lawrence River, and a tragic uh, part of that story is that among the 30 vessels that Canada lost in home waters during the Battle of the Atlantic was this one. SS Caribou was torpedoed and sunk on the 14th of October, 1942. Her loss represented the worst sea disaster that Canada suffered during the war. Hundreds of men, women, and children were cast into a very stormy nighttime sea when she sank in minutes after being struck by the torpedo. Uh, 132 people lost their lives. Next, please. Now, a bright part of that story is the courage of uh, this woman. Her name was, is, was Margaret Brooke. That's a photograph on the upper left of her during the war years. She was a nursing sister in the Royal Canadian Navy and was on her way to Newfoundland to assume duties in St. John's at the Naval Base. 
during the night after that ship sank, her single-handed courage in the boat she was in saved many lives, including the lives of some children. She was unfortunately unable to save a close friend of hers who she tried to hang on to all night in the icy, stormy seas. The picture on the right is Margaret uh, relatively recently. She passed away in 2016. But uh, an interesting side note to her story is that she was my mother-in-law's next door neighbor in Victoria, British Columbia. They used to garden together. And I knew her name was Margaret, but I didn't know she was the Margaret Brooke. And uh, a fairly wonderful thing is that Canada has named one of its six new ice patrol vessels, that's the photograph of the ship in the middle, after Margaret Brooke. And she lived to see that she'd been honored for her courage by having one of our newest warships named for her, HMCS Margaret Brooke. That vessel uh, was launched last year. She's going through trials right now as we speak. A good friend of mine is one of her deck officers and she'll be uh, assuming duties in the Arctic next spring. Next please. So back to World War II, uh, after Caribou was sunk with such terrible loss of life, Newfoundland still needed a connection with, with Canada. So uh, a steamship called the SS Burgio was assigned to the task and she began making daily runs back and forth, this time closely escorted by warships. And in November of 1944, the warship that was escorting her was HMCS Shawinigan, the, the ship we're, we're talking about this afternoon. Unbeknownst to our uh, people aboard Shawinigan or the people in the, in the ferry, that night, that day in 1944, a German submarine was stalking the ship. The submarine had been in the Gulf of St. Lawrence unsuccessfully attacking several convoys. It had been damaged uh, by the escorts and was actually making its way back home to Germany when it was going through Cabot Straits and encountered the ferry and her escort. It stalked the ferry for hours, trying to get in position to fire a torpedo at it, but the ferry got into Port Basque before the submarine could achieve a good firing position. The submarine settled down to wait, but during the night, it became impatient and it decided to take our Corvette instead. Next, please. This is a drawing of a Type 7 uh, German U-boat from the war years. It's quite similar to U-1228 that sank uh, our HMCS Schwinnigan. Now, uh, I'm jumping ahead in the story a little bit here because all the Navy and all Canada knew the on the morning uh, after November 24th, on the 25th of 1944, was that when the ferry came back out to go on her run back to Nova Scotia, there was no warship there to escort her. The weather was somewhat foggy and rather than hang around, the ferry's captain decided to beat it at full speed back to Sydney, Nova Scotia. And it wasn't for three days until somebody noticed that nobody had heard from Shawinigan. Nobody knew what had happened to her. She just disappeared and she was listed as missing in action with her 91 young Canadians on board her. It wasn't until after World War II when the records uh, accumulated and captured from the uh, Germans were assembled and people sat down matching them with our records that it was noticed in 1946 or seven that on the night of November 28th, that particular U-boat, whose record survived the war, recorded that she had torpedoed and sunk a small warship off the co off Port of Basque, Newfoundland. Next, please. So as I said, a warship is a community. This is a picture of the uh, 91 people, most of the 91 people, who were lost aboard Shawinigan. They came from all parts of Canada. The oldest was uh, barely 30 years old. Most of them were in their mid-20s, a few were in their late teens. Next, please. Each one of them had a name and a face. Uh, we know who they were, we know where they were from, and we've done our best over the years to honor them. But during the war years, they were all listed as missing in action. Nobody knew what had happened to them. The British historian John Keegan wrote uh, of the principle of what he described as ripples of grief that travel home from losses in wartime. One thing I learned was that those ripples and grief travel vertically through time as well while I was involved in this project. Next, please. So here we come to where my interface comes with HMCS Schwingen. As uh, uh, the uh, librarian's uh, kind introduction described, uh, I've worked for many years as a historian 
uh, being technical advisor and historical advisor to film and television projects. That's me in the upper uh, left on, on the set of a film. My job was to teach people how to look like sailors and officers and how, to, how, how wartime actions happen. And uh, I've done many of those pictures, uh, many of those projects. But in uh, 2005, an interesting thing happened. I was invited to speak at a Royal Canadian Navy uh, dinner commemorating the Battle of the Atlantic. And the upshot of that was that I was told that at age 50, I wasn't quite too old to join the Navy. And because I had a skill they wanted, that being my historical work, uh, they would support it if I went for a commission to become a Naval officer. Well, that's something I'd always wanted to do. I wished I'd done when I was in university when I should have, but circumstances led me in other directions in my life. So finally, in uh, 2005, uh, driving home from the dinner in Toronto that night, my wife and I were discussing what the next years might be like. And we commented that I suppose this is success. The business is going well. The consulting practice is going very well. And it just seems like a lot of work. And Caroline's comment to me was that this year, perhaps I should do something I always wanted to do. And I decided maybe that thing was to join the Royal Canadian Navy and become one of our officers. And I did. And that's me on the, uh, on the right as a uh, Naval officer. Next, please. So one of my first assignments uh, in the service was to work on the uh, upcoming Canadian Naval, Naval Centennial. And as part of that, I was assigned as an officer to join the modern HMCS Shawinigan. That's a picture I took of her as I was approaching her in a boat the first time I went aboard. The modern Shawinigan 704 is a uh, MCDV, as we call them, Maritime Coastal Defense Vessel. Canada's Navy has 12 of them. There are six on each coast, and there, were al there are always several patrolling at sea off our coasts. I was pretty excited to join her. I went by aircraft and bus uh, to Newfoundland. I arrived at the wharf at Port Basque, and I found myself with my duffel bag at my feet and my uniform standing there looking around, and there was no ship. Well, I heard voices after a while, and I looked over the edge. The tide was out, so the water was a long way down. And there were two young sailors in a uh, motorized boat, and they looked up and said, Sub-Lieutenant Laco. And I said, yes, that's me. Well, they were there to pick me up. So I jumped into the boat, and we went bombing out to sea out of the harbor uh, towards a blank horizon. And finally, after about half an hour of going at high speed, we saw a speck up ahead. And as we drew closer, there was Shawinigan. And that's a photograph I took of her as we approached. Uh, the boat came alongside. I climbed up the ladder. The pipes trilled, just like in the movies. I saluted the quarterdeck and rushed up to the bridge to pull my orders out of my tunic and hand them to the captain. And his comment back to me was, welcome aboard, Gord. Would you like a coffee? So what we were taxed with was to search for our modern Shawinigan's namesake, HMCS Schwinnigan, who was lost with all hands in 44. Next, please. I was very interested to note as a historian that the modern MCDV class, that's the black and white image on the lower right, is almost identical in performance and size to the wartime Corvettes. That's the old Schwinnigan up in the top left. They both do about 16 knots flat out. Uh, they both have very long legs, as sailors say, which means they can stay at sea a long time. They both roll abominably. In the, during the wartime years, uh, sailors used to describe that corvettes would roll on wet grass, let alone rough, rough seas. And I can tell you from personal experience, the modern MCDV will roll similarly. The modern vessels, of course, uh, are more lightly armed with regards to guns. But what they do have when required is the ability to have bolted on them any sort of missile or weapons defense system that may be required. Uh, they're normally relatively lightly armed uh, for coastal defense duties, but Canada has sent them all over the Atlantic Ocean as far as England, Africa, uh, and into Arctic waters. For the past 15 or 20 years, every winter, there's been two of them up in the Northwest Passage. And I remember vividly being at a planning meeting in Halifax one time having it described to me that it's further from Halifax, our main East Coast base, up to the entrance of the Northwest Passage than it is from Halifax to England. So that gives a, a bit of scope to the uh, magnitude of the size of the uh, patrolling duties that our Navy has. Next, please. 
So first thing we did at the beginning of our search for Shawinigan was uh, have a, a meeting of uh, all the uh, leading personnel aboard the modern Shawinigan. Uh, this is uh, left, uh, then Lieutenant Commander Neil Hanratty. He's a commander now, has risen considerably in the service, describing the plan for the search. We had assembled beforehand uh, volumes of material, including the uh, literal translation of the German U-boat's logbook, and as well as uh, decades of very detailed sensor work that the Canadian Navy has kept of our coasts. It's interesting that during World War II, it was noticed that because fresh water and or less brackish water and very brackish uh, Atlantic water were mixing around the coasts of Newfoundland because of the way the St. Lawrence River comes out uh, through the two outlets above and below Newfoundland, there are temperature and salinity changes in the sea that make it extremely difficult to hunt submarines. So what our Navy has done is take a full-time job that goes on every year and has since World War II of very, very minutely mapping uh, the features of the bottom of the ocean so we can tell if anything has ever changed. It might be a wreck. It might be a hostile submarine laying on the bottom waiting for the, for the patrolling ship to pass by. We also track, uh, besides by sonar, we track by what's known as magnetic anomalies, and that's done by ship and by aircraft. We constantly scan the sea off our coasts, particularly around Newfoundland, keeping track of spots, and that's what those red dots are, where magnetic anomalies have been noted. Some of them are known shipwrecks, some of them are iron ore deposits, some of them could be hostile submarines wandering into our waters. One of them is probably HMCS Shawinigan. So what we did was sit down together and make a list of which magnetic anomalies had been noticed that would be the most likely ones that we should investigate by using our side scan sonar uh, uh, towing over the, the waves. The uh, academic historians of the Royal Canadian Navy made a recommendation that we look to the east of where the U-boat said he sank our ship because of the way the current set there, and we, uh, they imagine that the wreck might drag and move along the bottom uh, in that direction. It's interesting to note that we've never been able to find Shawinigan before, although several searches happened. Uh, the one I participated in was the latest one, uh, which is a bit surprising because the U-boat captain was very specific about where he was when he fired his torpedo. We know what direction he fired the torpedo in and we know how long it ran, but there was uh, an anomaly there and I identified that. The, U the torpedo the U-boat fired was a homing torpedo called a NAT, G-N-A-T, that was our, our slang name for them, that was relatively slow moving, but had the ability to follow the underwater sounds made by the propellers or the screw of the target ship. So what we know is that uh, the position of the U-boat when it fired the torpedo, we know the position of the ship he was firing at when the torpedo was fired, but it followed the ship for several minutes. And at 12 knots, which is the speed he estimated and is a normal uh, patrolling speed for a, a Corvette, the ship could have traveled many hundreds of yards. Uh, and uh, when she was struck, uh, we don't know exactly where that was because she was probably steering an erratic course specifically designed to inhibit being struck by a torpedo. Next, please. So we set up to, to drop our devices. The uh, picture on the upper uh, left is of the, uh, uh, the fish. It's like a upside down kite that flies in the water beneath the ship and corresponding with the impulses received by the side scan sonar from that device, our technicians from HMCS Trinity, which is the Royal Canadian Navy's uh, intelligence branch, set up in the back of the bridge aboard the ship to watch the screen. You can see in that lower right picture, the uh, video camera we had set up so we could capture the moment if we saw something. The gentleman in the dark uh, combats, that's what we call that seagoing outfit, has in his hand a joystick, which he's actually flying the kite with. And the other fellow, uh, the officer in the blue shirt is ready to take notes of every anomaly that we discover. Next, please. So for 10 days, we mowed the lawn, as they say. Uh, back and forth and back and forth using the radar interface GPS to very carefully keep track of where we were and which patches of ocean we saw. 
Interestingly, the side scan sonar cannot look straight down. So there was a, a dead zone that we were blind on uh, right under the ship, but we could see port and starboard of her for several hundred meters. And we had to make sure that we were doing our runs back and forth overlapping. So we were covering those dead zones. We found a lot of interesting things during those 10 days, but we didn't find Shawinigan. And I was uh, quite concerned that she would be difficult to find because it's well known from other corvettes that have been found that were lost in the war, particularly HMCS Regina, which was sunk off the coast of Wales, that when uh, relatively small, lightly built warships strike the bottom, they're often going very rapidly. And if a vessel like a Corvette may have a surface displacement of around 980 tons, when she's full of water and doing maybe 30 knots towards the bottom, well, when she stops, that water that's inside her doesn't want to stop. So the momentum imparted by the plunge causes the water to blow out the sides of the ship and literally splatter them against the bottom. So unlike what you see in movies often of a virtually intact ship sitting on the bottom, uh, small warships are often just piles of rubble. So I'd armed myself with uh, drawings and photographs of every part of a Corvette that I could find that I thought might be solid enough to survive the impact with the bottom. Boilers, engines, her, her four inch gun shield and various parts of the ship. We found, like I said a moment ago, many interesting things. We found what we thought was a torpedo lying on the bottom. Who knows where that was from? We found the remains of a wooden sailing ship in dreadful condition, but lying on her starboard side with the rig extending above her. Uh, we'll never know who they were. We found a fully intact fishing boat with its outriggers up, uh, about 100 feet long, sitting on the bottom upright. The uh, Navy said they already knew about that one. Uh, it was probably a smuggler who'd scuttled himself rather than be, be captured. But we didn't find our Shawinigan until the very last day. And I remember clearly, I was speaking with uh, Captain Hanratty about uh, the fact that this was the last day we could search. And we were uh, zigging along, doing our, our slow scan, flying the kite. I was down below in this officer's mess eating, and suddenly I got whistled up to the bridge. Sub-Lieutenant Lacko report to the bridge. So up I went, and uh, what they'd found was an oval object with two crossbars on it about the size and shape of what's known as a Carly raft, which was a life-saving device used by our Navy and the Royal Navy during World War II. Well, that was very exciting, except Carly rafts don't have thwarts. They don't have those bars across them. We didn't know what it was. So as you can see on this uh, representation here, we did a number of passes at 90 degrees to get a view of it from a different angle. Uh, we couldn't tell what it was, but we GPSed its location to make note of when to come back later. Now, uh, if you look at that uh, drawing, uh, that map rather on the uh, radar screen, or uh, the GPS screen, you'll see Port of Basque, Newfoundland is up about 10 o'clock in the upper left corner. That's the harbor of Port of Basque there. And uh, Captain Henretti and I were looking, wondering what to, where to search on our last look. And we, I read him again the U-boat captain's description of the sinking of Shawinigan. He described that after running for several minutes, the homing torpedo struck the ship. There was a, uh, a column of water that rose uh, 300 meters high, that's a thousand feet, full of sparks and debris. And when the water subsided, the ship was gone. And we looked at each other and I said, sir, how long do you think that ship would have drifted before it sank if she was gone in the time it took the explosion splash to rise and fall? That's just maybe five seconds, maybe 10 seconds. And he looked at me and said, right, we decided to look further to the west. And sure enough, that's where we found the oval object. I'd also taken the care to put a newspaper story out in Port of Basque, Newfoundland, which is a very small place, and told people that I'd be sitting in the pub at a certain time. And if they had family stories remembering that night in November of 1944, I wanted to hear them. And three people did come. And they, uh, two of them told me that they, their parents had memories of hearing a big bang followed by several small bangs on that night. And the third person said that his father had, when he was a boy, dredged up what they thought were ship parts and artillery shells off the bottom and he showed me on the chart where that was. And that is actually in the area where we found the oval object. But we didn't find anything we were sure was her. Next, please. 
So about a year later, I was in Halifax. I was aboard HMCS Sackville, which is the uh, last surviving Corvette, a sister ship to Schwinnigan, that's kept in Halifax as a living memorial to the Battle of the Atlantic and the Royal Canadian Navy of those years. I was early for the meeting I was attending, so I took a walk around her, and when I was on her stern, I looked and I looked up, and what did I see but uh, her Carly rafts on their launching ramp. And I became very excited because there's the two crossbars. I think what we found was a Carly raft lying on the bottom with its launching ramp on top of it. The U-boat uh, description confirmed, and because of the type of torpedo as well, the torpedo struck her in the stern and uh, caused sympathetic explosions of her depth charges along with the main detonation that sank her. It's not inconceivable that that Carly raft and its launching apparatus was thrown off her and sank to the bottom, and that's what we saw. We've not been able to go back and look, but I hope to sometime. Next, please. So I mentioned about uh, uh, Keegan's ripples of grief. Uh, a number of things happened that really brought home the story of H.M. Sherwinigan to me. And one was when I was aboard another of our warships, the frigate uh, HMCS Ville de Quebec, VDQ as we call her. She's one of the 12 uh, large uh, seagoing patrol frigates that our Navy operates. A gentleman wearing a Shawinigan cap was in the crowd. And I was uh, talking with a bunch of people that were visiting us. And when I saw him, I pointed through the crowd and said, hey, you, stick around. I'd like to talk with you. And it transpired that I met Jerry Hurd. And Jerry told me that he was the son of one of the men that was lost aboard Shawinigan, the, the one that was sunk in the war. He told me a terrible story of how his father and mother met in a very quick wartime romance. Uh, she became pregnant, they became engaged, they married, and then he was sent to his ship He uh, from Oshawa, Ontario. He went ahead and joined the vessel she followed by train. And her plan was to work as a volunteer nurse in Sydney so as to be near him when the baby was born. Well, he went on his first trip aboard Schwinnigan, and she was sunk. And when she got to Sydney, BC, she, of course, heard the word that her husband was missing at sea and that he was never found. Jerry told me that his mother never remarried. And uh, he said that the idea that his father had just disappeared was like an open wound to his mother for the rest of her life. We invited Jerry to come to the commemoration ceremony that we threw for Shawinigan. And afterwards he told me, I have his letter beside me here, that uh, he felt that his father had finally received a funeral. And I was very, very glad to be able to have offered him some, some comfort. The other interesting and tragic perhaps I, uh, thing that happened was that I noticed over and over again that uh, there were 91 names on the list of the people who were lost aboard Shawinigan. But the ship's complement, or number of people that served in the vessel of that type at that point in the war, was 92. And sometimes there were 92 names, but there was one missing. And the name that was missing was Thomas Simpson, a gunner. And I discovered, uh, well, other people already knew, but I, I discovered that Mr. Simpson had been a young 18-year-old gunner aboard Shawinigan. He'd served in her for four months. And before she left Halifax, they were doing gunnery practice practicing loading the four inch gun on the vessel. And he somehow dropped a four inch practice shell on his foot. Well, those weigh 63 pounds. That's not an uh, inconsiderable object to drop on your foot, but he broke his foot. So he was put ashore. Three days later, a nurse walked in and put a copy of the Halifax Herald on his lap and said, hey, isn't that your ship? And the headline was HMCS Shawinigan missing. Mr. Simpson was the only survivor of the ship. All his colleagues were lost at sea, were lost in her. He went through his whole life knowing that he was the only person left. He served the rest of the war and survived it all. I decided to try to find him. And uh, we found an address for him in Windsor, Ontario. We found that was stale. He'd moved to Winnipeg where he was living. And I invited him to come to our commissioning ceremony, but uh, due to age, he wasn't able to travel. So I arranged to have an officer go and read my speech commemorating the loss of the ship to him at the local Legion Hall. And that's what that photograph is of there. When we were arranging the, uh, the, the event uh, in his honor at his Legion in 
Winnipeg, uh, he asked me at the end of a discussion if uh, he could ask me a personal question. I said, of course, sir. And he said, Gordon, could you tell me the name of the man who died in my place? I've never known. And I thought about it for a second, and then there came that disparity in the numbers again. 91 names were lost in the ship. 92 was her compliment, and I was able to tell Thomas Simpson they didn't have time to replace him. Nobody went to sea in his place. Nobody died in his place. And he told me that nobody had ever told him that. And I was very pleased to be able to give that gentleman that comfort. And I think if I were to put my finger on something that was the most important thing I did during my 11 years as a naval officer, I would say it was telling that to that gentleman. And I was glad I was able to do it. Next, please. So um, this is a photograph I took of the command team of HMCS Shawinigan, the modern vessel. Something I was struck by when I began going to sea as a real naval officer in the modern Navy is that once they get out of cell phone range of the coast, which is pretty darn quick, it's just like the old days out there. They're completely isolated and the North Atlantic is still the North Atlantic. There's young Canadians right now, even as I'm speaking to you out there at sea patrolling our coasts, winter and summer, Atlantic and Pacific, they often get sent to far away, da very dangerous parts of the world. And uh, I'm very proud that I was one of them for a while. So uh, that's, the, that's my talk. And uh, Gordon, if you could put me back on the screen, I'd uh, welcome any questions that any of you might have about what I've described to you or about anything else I may have worked on that you, uh, you're curious about. I'll start. I'm, it's more of a comment. Um, I found that fascinating what you have spoke about and what really brings it to a more personal level is, is when you bring in the human um, interest stories of the man who lost his, his parents and then this other gentleman um, who you also spoke about. I just, I find that when I hear stories of history, it puts it at a distance for me. And then as soon as something like that happens and we're right at the age and time where people will be passing and we won't have this information. So I really appreciate all your work and what you've done and, and making that human connection. So it's not so much a question, but just a comment of appreciation. So I, I, met yeah. a, I, I, I met another gentleman who lives in Orangeville, Ontario, whose older brother was one of the seamen aboard Shawinigan. And uh, he did come to our ceremony. And when I was traveling with him, I had several hours to talk. And he told me that he was 12 years old when, uh, in 1944, when his older brother was lost. And he described how uh, his father was the principal of the local school. I, I, oh, sorry, I messed up my story. He wasn't the principal, he was a local businessman. And uh, this gentleman was in school and he got a word to his, his word teacher came to him and said a message had just come, go home now. It was the middle of the afternoon. And that was uh, a very unusual thing. So he jumped on his bike and he was riding home and he saw his father's secretary walking down the street. She was normally very friendly, but she wouldn't talk to him. And he thought he was in trouble. When he got to his parents' house, he ran in the door and he saw his mother and father standing in the kitchen hugging each other. And uh, they shared with him the news that his older brother was missing in action, presumed lost at sea aboard Shawinigan. Apparently, the uh, local uh, uh, telegraph uh, office had a, a relationship with the principal of the school, and the principal knew that this gentleman's uh, mother was home alone, so they made sure that the telegram did not come to the house while she was alone, and they arranged for the family to gather, and uh, that's a, a bit of the human side of things. There was another brother in that family, and he uh, joined the Royal Canadian Air Force, and he uh, became a bomber pilot. And before he went to join uh, the war, at the end of his training, he got a message to his family in Orangeville. And the message was, be outside at three o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow. So they went out and stood outside. And what came over their street at just at treetop height was a Lancaster four-engine bomber with the brother flying it. And he wagged his wings as he went by. Uh, he didn't fly that aircraft to the war, but that was his way of saying goodbye to his town. Uh, he did survive and, ma and made it make it home. Yes, there's. Um, I read a while ago uh, that the rate of attrition, deaths among 
people who actually participated in World War II exceeded the death rate at the hottest parts of the war. We're losing uh, more than 400 of those, those people a week now. And uh, the number of them that is left who can actually tell people stories of what they saw and felt is getting thinner and thinner. But as uh, John Keegan wrote about his ripples of grief traveling home from when a death or an injury occurs in action, the grief travels vertically. And I think myself, speaking personally, it's important to remember those things because uh, there won't be people around to tell those stories uh, much longer as, as we lost a number of years ago, the last person that was alive in, in the Great War, in World War I. And going from that thought, there are people still today that uh, at this very moment are in very dangerous parts of the world and colleagues of mine that went to Afghanistan or to Bosnia and Africa and other hot places uh, to serve us. And uh, I'm grateful for them and I hope you are too. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And, and just just the fact that we've recorded your, your talk today will have um, this information available to people. I think that's so important. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Gordon Lacko, for for your talk today and all you've done um, for our country and and um, and sharing this. And that's a huge part of it now is sharing these stories. So we'll look forward to maybe having you again sometime.